Welcome to 2024 and the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the first quarter. Welcome to lesson number four, titled The Lord Hears and Delivers, ready for teaching on January 27. It's from the Sabbath School lesson series, Psalms, authored by Dr. Dragoslava Santrak and read by Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, January 20. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, We thank you for this series of lessons that come from your word about how you care for each of us, about how in the book of Psalms you hear and you deliver us. And as we open your word this week, we pray that these Psalms may stand out to us. May we see your love and your grace. May we see Jesus and may we see how we relate to you in a far more honest and open way as we open your word. Lord, I'd like to pray today for those who are listening who aren't able to see as well as they would like to, such as Lois Henry. And Lord, I'd also like to pray for Emma Hernandez in Texas who's asked for prayer, and Portia Morris and her family, and Gina Mendoza and her family, and Nasa Senegva and Dalton and siblings, and Raquel Lara, Uh, and Kelly and Nicole and friends and Alice in Kenya. Lord, people are listening from all over the world. And although I don't know everyone's name, please bless each one who is listening and watching uh, the reading of this Sabbath school lesson today. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, memory text this week comes from Psalm 34 and verse 7. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. Let's read that again, Psalm 34, verse 17. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears, and delivers them out of all their troubles. Again and again, the Psalms highlight the truth that the sovereign Lord, who created and sustains the universe, also reveals himself as a personal God who initiates and sustains a relationship with his people. God is close to his people and to his creation, both on heaven and on earth. We read in Psalm 73, verses 23 and 25. Verse 23 reads, Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold me by my right hand. And verse 25, Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is none upon earth that I desire besides you. Though he has established his throne in heaven in Psalm 103 verse 19 and rides on the clouds in Psalm 68 4, he also is near to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth in Psalm 145 verse 18. The Psalms unswervingly uphold the truth that the Lord is the living God who acts on behalf of those who call upon him. And we referred here to Psalm 55 verses 16 to 22. As for me, I will call upon God and the Lord shall save me. Evening and morning and at noon I will pray and cry aloud and he shall hear my voice. He has redeemed my soul in peace from the battle that was against me, for there were many against me. God will hear and afflict them, even he who abides from of old, Selah. Because they do not change, therefore they do not fear God. He has put forth his hands against those who were at peace with him. He has broken his covenant. The words of his mouth were smoother than butter, but war was in his heart. His words were softer than oil, yet they were drawn swords. Cast your burden on the Lord, and he shall sustain you. He shall never permit the righteous to be moved. The Psalms are meaningful precisely because they are prompted by and are addressed to the living God who hears and answers prayer. We should remember that the proper response to the Lord's nearness consists in a life of faith in Him and of obedience to His commandments. Nothing short of this faith and obedience will be acceptable to Him as the history of Israel often revealed. Psalm 
Sunday, January 21, my frame was not hidden from you. Read Psalm 139, verses 1 to 18. How does this text poetically depict God's power? In verses 1 to 6, his presence in verses 7 to 12, and his goodness in verses 13 to 18. What does God's greatness say about God's promises? Psalm 139, beginning at verse 1. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. You have hedged me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit, or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. For you formed my inward parts, you covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvellous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skilfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they all were written. The days fashioned for me, when, as yet, there was none of them. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God! How great is the sum of them! If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with you." Did you ever want to help someone but had no means? Likewise, some people tried to help you but did not understand your needs? Unlike even the most loving and best-intentioned people, God has both the perfect knowledge of us and of our circumstances and also the means to help us. Therefore, his promises of help and deliverance are not shallow platitudes, but firm assurances. God's knowledge of the psalmist is so great and unique that even his mother's womb could not hide him from God, as we read in verses 13, For you formed my inward parts, you covered me in my mother's womb, and verse 15, My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Divine knowledge pertains to time. We read in verse 2, You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. And inner being, in verse 2 again, You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down. And verse 4, For there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. And space, and comprehend my path and my lying down, and are acquainted with all my ways, in verse 3. The psalmist's entire existence. God's wonderful knowledge is the result of his creatorship and close acquaintance with people and is manifest in his care for them. This wonderful truth about God, knowing us intimately, should not scare us, but instead drive us into the arms of Jesus and what he has accomplished for us at the cross. For by faith in Jesus, we have been given his righteousness, the righteousness of God himself, as you read in Romans 3, verse 5. But if our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unjust who inflicts wrath? I speak as a man. And verse 21, But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. 
God's presence is highlighted by depicting God as reaching as far as hell or Sheol, the grave, and darkness. As we read in Psalm 139, verse 8, If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. And verses 11 and 12, If I say, Surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. And these are places not typically depicted as where God dwells, because we read in Psalm 56 verse 13, For you have delivered my soul from death. Have you not kept my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of of the living. His presence also is depicted as taking the wings of the morning, that's the east, to reach the uttermost parts of the sea, that's the west, in Psalm 139 verse 9, if I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea. What these images convey is the truth that there is no place in the universe where we cannot be out of God's reach. Though God is not part of the universe, as some believe, he is close to it all, having not only created it, but sustaining it as well, as we read in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3. And that reads who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. As the one who knows all about us, God can help and restore us. The fresh realisation of his greatness prompts an outburst of praise and renewed trust in the psalmist. He welcomes divine scrutiny as the means that can remove from his life anything that troubles his relationship with God. And so to finish today, some might find the fact that God knows so much about them, even their darkest secrets, a rather frightening thought. Why is the gospel then our only hope? Monday, January 22, Assurance of God's Care. Read Psalm 40, verses 1 to 3, Psalm 50, verse 15, Psalm 55, verse 22, and Psalm 121. How is God involved in our daily affairs? Psalm 40, beginning at verse 1, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. He also brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock, and established my steps. He has put a new song in my mouth, praise to our God. Many will see it and fear, and will trust in the Lord. And Psalm 50 verse 15, call upon me in the day of trouble, I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. And Psalm 55 22, cast your burden on the Lord and he shall sustain you. He shall never permit the righteous to be moved. And Psalm 121, I will lift up my eyes to the hills. From whence comes my help? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth, and even for evermore. The Lord reveals himself in Scripture as the living God who acts on behalf of those who call upon him. For the psalmist, the Lord is always before me, in Psalm 16, verse 8. Therefore, he trusts God and calls upon him, as we read in Psalm 7, verse 1, O Lord my God, in you I put my trust. Save me from all those who persecute me 
and deliver me. And Psalm 9 verse 10, And those who know your name will put their trust in you, for you, Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. The Lord will hear him even when he cries out of the depths, as you read in Psalm 130 verses 1 and 2. Out of the depths I have cried to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplication. And this conveys that no life circumstance escapes God's sovereign dominion. Thus, the psalmist's cry, no matter how urgent, is never devoid of hope. Psalm 121, meanwhile, which we read, celebrates the power of the Creator in the faithful individual's life. This power includes, one, he will not allow your foot to be moved, in verse 3. The image of foot is often described or descriptive of one's life journey, as we read in Psalm 66, verse 9. Who keeps our soul among the living and does not allow our feet? to be moved. And Psalm 119, verse 105, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And Proverbs chapter 3, verse 23, Then you will walk safely in your way and your foot will not stumble. The Hebrew word for move describes the security that God gives to the world. In Psalm 93 verse 1, The Lord reigns, he is clothed with majesty, the Lord is clothed, he has girded himself with strength, surely the world is established so that it cannot be moved. And to Zion in chapter or Psalm 125, verse 1, Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved, but abides forever. And two, the image of the Lord as Israel's keeper, who does not slumber nor sleep, highlights the Lord's constant alertness and readiness to act on behalf of his children in Psalm 121 verses 3 and 4. And three, the Lord is your shade, we read in verses 5 and 6, and that calls to mind the pillar of cloud in the time of the Exodus, as you read in Exodus 13 verses 21 and 22. Two, and the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, so as to go by day and night. He did not take away the pillar of cloud by day or the pillar of fire by night from before the people. Similarly, the Lord provides physical and spiritual shelter to his people. And four, God is at their right hand, we read in verse five. The right hand typically designates a person's stronger hand, the hand of action. As you read in Psalm 74 verse 11, why do you withdraw your hand, even your right hand, take it out of your bosom and destroy them? And Psalm 89, verse 13 you have a mighty arm strong is your hand and high is your right hand here it conveys God's nearness and favour as we also read in Psalm 16 verse 8 I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand I shall not be moved. And Psalm 109 verse 31, for he shall stand at the right hand of the poor to save him from those who condemn him. And Psalm 110 verse 5, the Lord is at your right hand, he shall execute kings in the day of his wrath. 5. God's protection of his people is clearly confirmed in Psalm 121, verses 6 and 8, which we read. God shall preserve his children from all evil. Neither the sun nor the moon shall strike them. God shall preserve their going out and coming in. These poetic figures underline God's comprehensive, unceasing care. The bottom line? The psalmist trusted in God's loving care. We, of course, should do the same. And so to finish today, what are some practical ways that you can better experience the reality of God's care? How can you better cooperate with God in order to enable Him to work within you and for you?
Tuesday, January 23, the Lord is a refuge in adversity. Read Psalm 17, verses 7 to 9, Psalm 31, 1 to 3, and Psalm 91, verses 2 to 7. What does the psalmist do in times of trouble? Psalm 17, beginning at verse 7, Show your marvellous loving kindness to your right hand, O you who save those who trust in you from those who rise up against them. Keep me as the apple of your eye, hide me under the shadow of your wings from the wicked who oppress me, from my deadly enemies who surround me. And Psalm 31, beginning at verse 1. In you, O Lord, I put my trust. Let me never be ashamed. Deliver me in your righteousness. Bow down your ear to me. Deliver me speedily. Be my rock of refuge, a fortress of defence to save me. For you are my rock and my fortress. Therefore, for your name's sake, lead me and guide me. And Psalm 91, beginning at verse 2. I will say to the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God. In Him I will trust. Surely He shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with His feathers and under His wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. The psalmist encounters various sorts of troubles and in them turns to the Lord, who is a refuge in every adversity. Trust is a deliberate choice to acknowledge God's lordship over one's life in all circumstances. If trust does not work in adversity, then it will not work anywhere. The psalmist's testimony, I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in Him I will trust, in Psalm 91 verse 2, springs from his past experience with God and now serves to strengthen his faith for the future. The psalmist calls God the Most High and Almighty in verses 1 and 2, remembering the surpassing greatness of God. God, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High, shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in Him I will trust. The psalmist calls God the Most High and Almighty in those two verses, remembering the surpassing greatness of his God. The psalmist also tells of the security that one can find in God, the secret place, shelter or hiding place, shadow in verse 1, refuge, fortress in verse 2, wings, shield and buckler in verse 4, and dwelling place in verse 9. These images represent safe havens in the psalmist culture. One needs only to think of the unbearable heat of the sun in that part of the world in order to appreciate the shadow or shade or to recall the times of wars in Israel's history in order to value the security provided by the shield or the fortress. Read Psalm 17, verse 8, and Matthew 23, verse 37. What image is used here and what does it reveal? Psalm 17, verse 8. Keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me under the shadow of your wings. And then Jesus talking in Matthew 23, verse 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. One of the most intimate metaphors is the one that refers to being under the shadow of your wings in Psalm 17 verse 8. It's also used in Psalm 57 and verse 1. 
Be merciful to me, O God, be merciful to me, for my soul trusts in you, and in the shadow of your wings I will make my refuge until these calamities have passed by. And Psalm 63, verse 7, Because you have been my help, therefore in the shadow of your wings I will rejoice. This metaphor elicits comfort and assurance by implying the protection of a mother bird. The Lord is compared to an eagle who guards its young with its wings. In Exodus 19 verse 4, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. And in Deuteronomy 32 verse 11, As an eagle stirs up its nest, hovers over its young, spreading out its wings, taking them up, carrying them on its wings. And to a hen who gathers her chicks under her wings, Matthew 23, verse 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. And so to finish the day. How, though, do we deal with the times when calamity strikes and we can't seem to see God's protection? Why do these traumas not mean that the Lord is not there with us? Wednesday, January 24, Defender and Deliverer Read 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 to 4. How does Paul describe the Exodus story? And what spiritual lesson does he seek to teach with it? 1 Corinthians chapter 10, beginning at verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Read Psalm 114. How is the divine deliverance of the people of Israel from Egypt poetically described here? Psalm 114, beginning at verse 1. When Israel went out of Egypt, the house of Jacob from a people of strange language, Judah became his sanctuary, and Israel his dominion. The sea saw it and fled, Jordan turned back, the mountains skipped like rams, the little hills like lambs. What ails you, O sea, that you fled? O Jordan, that you turned back? O mountains, that you skipped like rams? O little hills like lambs? Tremble, O earth, at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob, who turned the rock into a pool of water, the flint into a fountain of waters. What a poetic description of God's marvellous deliverance of his children from the bondage in Egypt is given in Psalm 114. All through the Old Testament and even in the New, the deliverance from Egypt was seen as a symbol of God's power to save his people. Paul, in these verses in 1 Corinthians, does just that, seeing the whole true story as a metaphor, a symbol of salvation in Jesus Christ. Psalm 114 also depicts divine deliverance through God's sovereignty as the creator over the powers of nature, which was how he saved his people in the Exodus. The sea, the river Jordan, and the mountains and hills poetically represent the natural and human powers opposing the Israelites on their way to the promised land. As you read in Deuteronomy 1 verse 44, And the Amorites who dwelt in that mountain came out against you and chased you as bees do, and drove you back from Seir to Hormah. And Joshua chapter 3 verses 14 to 17. So it was when the people set out from their camp to cross over the Jordan with the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people, and as those who bore the Ark came to the Jordan, and the feet of the priests who bore the Ark dipped in the edge of the water, for the Jordan overflows all its banks during the whole time of harvest, that the waters which came down from upstream 
stood still and rose in a heap very far away at Adam, the city that is beside Zaratan. So the waters that went down into the sea of the Arabah, the salt sea, failed and were cut off, and the people crossed over opposite Jericho. Then the priests who bore the ark of the covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan, and all Israel crossed over on dry ground until all the people had crossed completely over the Jordan. God, though, is sovereign over all of them. In fact, for many of God's children in all times and in all places, the way to the heavenly Jerusalem is fraught with danger. The Psalms encourage them to look beyond the hills and toward the Creator of heaven and earth, as we read in Psalm 121, verse 1, I will lift up my eyes to the hill from whence comes my help. The spirit of Psalm 114 is captured by Jesus' calming of the sea storm and his proclamation that the church has nothing to fear because he has overcome the world, as you read in Matthew 8, 23 to 27. Now, when he got into a boat, his disciples followed him, and suddenly a great tempest arose on the sea so that the boat was covered with the waves. But he was asleep. Then his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we are perishing. But he said to them, Why are you fearful, O you of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. So the men marveled, saying, Who can this be, that even the winds and the sea obey him and John sixteen thirty three, these things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. The Lord's great deeds on behalf of his people should inspire the whole earth to tremble at his presence. We read in Psalm 114, verse 7, Tremble, O earth, at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob. The trembling should be understood as acknowledging and worshipping rather than as being terrified. We read this in Psalm 96 verse 9. O worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. And in Psalm 99 verse 1. The Lord reigns. Let the people tremble. He dwells between the cherubim. Let the earth be moved. With God on their side... Believers have nothing to fear. And so to finish today, what are some of the spiritual dangers we face as believers? And how can we learn to lean on the Lord's power to protect us from succumbing to these dangers that are as real for us now as they were for the psalmist? Thursday, January 25, Help from the Sanctuary. Read Psalm 3, verse 4, 14, 7, 21 to 3, 27, 5, 36, 8, 61, 4, and 68, 5, and 35. Where does help come from in these texts? First of all, Psalm 3, verse 4. And that reads, I cried to the Lord with my voice, and he heard me from his holy hill, Selah. And Psalm 14, verse 7, O oh, that the salvation of Israel might come out of Zion. When the Lord brings back the captivity of his people, let Jacob rejoice and Israel be glad. And Psalm 20, verses 1 to 3, May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob defend you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and strengthen you out of Zion. May he remember all your offerings and accept your burnt sacrifice. Selah. And Psalm 27, verse 5. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret place of his tabernacle, he shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. And Psalm 36, verse 8. They are abundantly satisfied with the fullness of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your pleasures. And Psalm 61. 
in verse 4, I will abide in your tabernacle forever. I will trust in the shelter of your wings. Salah. And Psalm 68, verse 5, A father of the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy habitation. And verse 35, O God, you are more awesome than your holy places. The God of Israel is he who gives strength and power to his people. Blessed be God. The motif of spiritual and physical refuge and help notably appears in the context of the sanctuary. The sanctuary is a place of help, of safety and of salvation. The sanctuary provides a shelter to the troubled. God defends the orphans and widows and gives strength to his people from his sanctuary. When, as it reads in Psalm 50 verse 2, out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God will shine forth. God's righteous judgments are proclaimed and the Lord's blessing goes forth. We read in Psalm 84 and verse 4. Blessed are those who dwell in your house, they will still be praising you, Selah. And Psalm 128, verse 5, The Lord bless you out of Zion, and may you see the good of Jerusalem all the days of your life. And Psalm 134, verse 3, The Lord who made heaven and earth bless you from Zion. The refuge in the sanctuary surpasses the security provided by any other place in the world because God personally dwells in the sanctuary. The presence of God, not merely the temple as a firm building, provides safety. Likewise, being the mountain where the Lord dwells, Mount Zion surpasses other mountains, though in itself it was a modest hill. As we read in Psalm 68, 15 and 16, a mountain of God is the mountain of Bashan. A mountain of many peaks is the mountain of Bashan. Why do you fume with envy, you mountains of many peaks? This is the mountain which God desires to dwell in. Yes, the Lord will dwell in it forever. And Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2, Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow to it. And then in Hebrews 4, verses 15 and 16, we read, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy to find grace to help in time of need. In what ways do these verses parallel what the psalmist says about the sanctuary? The holiness of God's sanctuary prompts the psalmist to acknowledge that all people are sinful and completely undeserving of God's favour, and he claims that deliverance is based on God's faithfulness and grace alone. As you read in Psalm 143 verse 2, Do not enter into judgment with your servant, for in your sight no one living is righteous. And verses 9 to 11, Deliver me, O Lord, from my enemies. In you I take shelter. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Your spirit is good. Lead me in the land of uprightness. Revive me, O Lord, for your name's sake. For your righteousness' sake, bring my soul out of trouble. In your mercy, cut off my enemies and destroy all those who afflict my soul, for I am your servant. Nothing in us gives us any merit before God. It is only when people stand in a right relationship with God through repentance and acceptance of God's grace and forgiveness that they can plead for God's assurance of deliverance. The sanctuary service represented the salvation found in Jesus. Friday, January 26, Further Thought 
If you have the opportunity, you might like to read the chapter The Night of Wrestling on pages 195 to 203 in Patriarchs and Prophets. What can we learn from Jacob's experience about the power of importunate prayer and unreserved trust in God? The Psalms strengthen our faith in God, who is the never-failing refuge for those who entrust their lives into His mighty hands. God will do great things for those who trust Him, Ellen White writes in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 493. The reason why His professed people have no greater strength is that they trust so much in their own wisdom and do not give the Lord an opportunity to reveal His power in their behalf. He will help His believing children in every emergency if they will place their entire confidence in him and faithfully obey him. End of quote. Yet some psalms can pose a serious challenge when what they promise and our current situation do not match. At times such as this, we just have to learn to trust in the goodness of God, most powerfully revealed at the cross. Also, at times, some psalms can be used to foster false hopes. Jesus' response to Satan's corrupted use of Psalm 91 verses 11 and 12 shows that trusting God must not be confused with tempting God, as we read in Matthew 4, 5 and 7, or presumptuously asking God to do something that is contrary to his will. Let's read Psalm 91 verses 11 and 12 and then see how Jesus uses it. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways, in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. And then Matthew 4, verses 5 to 7. Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on a pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. The greatest victories to the church of Christ or to the individual Christians are not those who are gained by talent or education, by wealth or the favour of men, Ellen White writes in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 203. They are those victories that are gained in the audience chamber with God when earnest, agonising faith lays hold upon the mighty arm of power. End of quote. And that brings us to our two discussion questions for this week. One, in class, discuss the answer to the last question in Tuesday's study about trusting in God amid adversity and when things go terribly wrong. How does one understand these things and how they could happen to people, even with all the wonderful promises in the Psalms about God's protection? Think about this too. Did not the psalmist, who wrote about these wonderful promises, suffer adversity or know of faithful people who did as well? And two, how can we develop unreserved trust in God in all circumstances? And there are some texts here for us to check. The first is... Psalm 91, verse 14, Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high, because he has known my name. And Psalm 143, verses 8, Cause me to hear your loving kindness in the morning, for in you do I trust. Cause me to know the way in which I should walk, for I lift up my soul to you. And verse 10, teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Your spirit is good. Lead me in the land of uprightness. And then Psalm 145 verses 18 to 20. The Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. He will fulfill the desire of those who fear him. He also will hear their cry and save them. The Lord preserves all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. What can cause us to lose this confidence? 
Why is trusting God in good times crucial for learning to trust Him in bad times as well? And now it's time for Inside Story with Sibylla Harold. Thank you, Sibylla. Prayer Answered in Perth by Joe Paola Margaret and her husband, Levana, were sitting one morning in their living room in Perth, Australia, after returning the previous night from a trip to Papua New Guinea, located some 2,000 miles or 4,500 kilometres away. Margaret was reflecting quietly on her father's parting words at the airport. After praying with her, he had said, Margaret, Jesus is coming back very soon. When you arrive at your home in Perth, my God will be at your door the next day. Not far from Margaret and Levana's home, literature evangelist Joe Lang and several friends were praying at a Seventh-day Adventist church. They were praying for divine appointments as they prepared to head out for a day of canvassing. A couple of hours later, Jock... Joe knocked on the door of Margaret and Levana's home. The home looked no different from the other houses on the street. Levana opened the door and politely looked through the cookbook that Joe showed him, but he didn't express any real interest in the book. Then Joe gave him a copy of Ellen White's The Great Controversy and began telling him about it. Levana flipped through the several pages and called to his wife. Do we have this book? he asked. Margaret came to the door and confirmed that they did have the book. She turned to Joe and explained that she was a former Seventh-day Adventist. The words tumbled from her mouth. We just came home from Papua New Guinea last night, she said. The last thing that my dad said to me was that he would be praying for God to show up at my house. It was a hot day in Perth, approximately 109.5 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about 43 degrees Celsius. But Jo felt goosebumps on her arms. She and Margaret looked at each other with big smiles and marvelled at how God had answered the prayer of Margaret's father. Wouldn't it be great if I could come to your church and share this story, Margaret said. It would, Jo agreed, and the two exchanged phone numbers. A few weeks later, Margaret stood with tears in her eyes at Bickley Seventh-day Adventist Church and told her story of how God had found a lost straying lamb. God used a woman with a copy of the Great Controversy in Australia to answer a father's passionate prayer in Papua New Guinea. Join the Seventh-day Adventist World Church in the mass promotion and distribution of the Great Controversy in 2023 and 2024. Visit greatcontroversyproject.org for more information or ask your pastor. <laughs> 